Hi everyone. Let's review chapter 14, which is disorders of the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Make sure you pay attention to the symptoms of the medical disorders and the medical nutrition therapy. So as you can see from this picture, it depicts there's a lot of things going on with the liver. Um, so I like to call the liver as a nutrition hub for the metabolism of various macronutrients and vitamins and minerals. You can see from the GI tract, glucose and the disaccharides, as well as fatty acids, amino acids, and vitamins and minerals will feed into the liver, um, as well as from the kidney, the liver's ability to form urea from ammonia. The um, liver also has the ability to break down glycogen into glucose to be utilized by the cells to maintain blood glucose homeostasis. And then also um, with conjunction with the gallbladder, there is um, bile involvement to break down the dietary fatty acid. Okay, so next let's focus on viral hepatitis. So important for you to know um, the difference between hepatitis A, B, C, D, and A, and E rather. Um, so here you wanna focus on how it's transmitted and um, what areas around the world um, are more prevalent to this particular hepatitis, and then what is the recommended diet therapy. Okay. So the first we start with hepatitis A that's transmitted by fecal um, oral route, and typically um, countries that are common areas of poor sanitation, um, they don't have a good running water supply, it's overcrowded. So no antiretroviral medication is necessary, a nutrient dense diet, it's recommended to avoid alcohol and it's um, rapidly onset. So hepatitis B is trans Admitted through blood, semen, um, and vaginal mucus, um, so sexual contact. Now, with hepatitis B, it's important to understand that it can withstand extreme temperatures and humidity. Um, so, typically for hepatitis B, we see IV drug abuse, um, patients with hemophilia those going, undergoing hemodialysis for acute renal disease or chronic renal failure, um, and those that have undergone a organ transplant are all at risk for hepatitis B. It is a slow onset, and again, um, adequate diet, no alcohol. We tend to see it in, it's prevalent in the Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. One thing to know with hepatitis B that it can lead to cancer, um, it's called hepatocellular carcinoma. So that is one of the risk factors. Hepatitis C is common and it's the most common and prevalent in the United States. It is transmitted through blood, saliva, and semen. Um, this onset is slow. Um, Typically, hepatitis C can lead to cirrhosis of the liver, um, and we typically see it um, in IV drug abuse, acupuncture, and uh, tattoos. And there, I mentioned there's a risk of cirrhosis and carcinoma. Okay. So hepatitis D is called a co-infection or super-infection because 
only patients with hepatitis B can be exposed to hepatitis D. So B and D go together. IV drug abuse is typically a risk factor. Um, important to know where hepatitis D is prevalent, and it's typically in the Mediterranean, the countries that are surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, which is Italy, Greece, France, Turkey, um, but also in the uh, Middle East, the Amazon Basin, um, countries in Asia, so um, China, Japan, Taiwan, it used to be called Burma, but now it's called Myanmar. And um, typically, again, the IV drug abuse um, is how you can get So lastly, hepatitis E transmitted through oral fecal route. We see these in countries that have a tropical climate. So if you travel there, it's really important um, that you take precaution. So tropical climates, um, Hep E is prevalent in India. And the symptoms include anorexia, nausea, vomiting. We'll see uh, malaise, weight loss, dehydration as well. Sometimes the liver enzymes ALT, AST are elevated. So we will see jaundice. And one of the ways to look for jaundice is in like the whites of the eyes. They're dehydrated, so they have um, dark colored urine and light colored stools. How to prevent this is always bring bottled water. Do not drink from running streams and um, do not consume uncooked vegetables and fruits. They have to be cooked and use only commercially bottled water. Okay, so in general, the nutrition therapy for viral hepatitis is we push fluids initially. So um, if they cannot eat or orally, then they have to have IV fluids, TPN, and then um, switch to a clear liquid diet and progress to small frequent meals. Those are that are high in calories um, with a high quality protein. We want to push fluids between 2,500 and 3,000 mLs per day. And we do recommend a multivitamin, especially with the B-complex vitamins. Okay, so let's go into cirrhosis of the liver. Um, cirrhosis involves a buildup of that fibrous connective tissue. Typically, um, patients are alcoholics. They have some type of hepatitis, usually hepatitis C. Um, they might have a blocked biliary duct, um, chronic autoimmune illness, and it could be the result of overdosing on certain um, toxic drugs that are metabolized in the liver. So complications, we usually see the portal hypertension. We see increased pressure in that portal vein in the liver, um, as well as esophageal varices. So the medical nutrition for esophageal varices is to include modifying the diet to a mechanical soft diet. Um, so there's no um, hard stringy foods, so basically soft foods. Um, if hard stringy foods affect the mucosal lining of the esophagus, it could rupture and unfortunately the patient could die. Okay, so this picture depicts on the left what a normal liver tissue looks like. On the right, this is someone who has fatty liver disease, cirrhosis of the liver. You can see the scarring in between and where the fatty infiltration occurs. And that usually occurs in cirrhosis.
The top two symptoms for cirrhosis is ascites and hepatic encephalopathy. So ascites, we talked about, that is fluid accumulation in the abdominal cavity. We treat it by, um, from a diet standpoint, a sodium restriction, and sometimes patients need to be on a fluid restriction. Hepatic encephalopathy um, involves the brain. And typically what happens is, do you remember um, from the liver, there's a breakdown of ammonia. And the ammonia builds up in the blood and it crosses the blood-brain barrier into the brain causing brain damage. So there's all this ammonia buildup in the blood and it results in a, what's called a hepatic coma. They're not necessarily in a coma, but um, when I used to work at Strozier Hospital, we did have a floor for um, patients with cirrhosis. And basically the changes were, they had behavioral changes. Um, they were very, very confused. They had memory loss. When you asked them questions, they weren't able to answer your questions. They didn't know where they were. Um, so the treatment, um, for hepatic encephalopathy is antibiotic therapy. Um, so we treat with neomycin and lactulose. Um, so what is lactulose? It's actually a carb, it's a disaccharide um, that lactulose is metabolized by the intestinal bacteria. So what happens is it helps to decrease the stool pH which in turn, when you decrease the stool pH, you trap the ammonia in the colon so the ammonia can be excreted. And so that helps to decrease the um, ammonia levels um, to a point where they're not toxic anymore. Typically with cirrhosis, we're focused on protein. So we recommend 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. We also use branch chain amino acids and those are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. So the branch chain amino acids will surpass liver metabolism. This is really important because it was cirrhosis of the liver um, there's a buildup of ammonia, it's not functioning properly. The branch chains can be used as protein, um, so it surpasses the liver, there's not that metabolism involved, and they can be utilized by the cells rapidly or immediately. Um, okay, another tip here is the recommendation from a nutrition standpoint is to use plant-based proteins, okay? So not your animal products like the red meat, poultry, pork, and fish, but the plant-based proteins, the dried bees and peen, beans, <laughs> rather lentils, um, legumes, because they produce less ammonia than the animal products. And so that is actually the best plant um, food source for a patient with encephalopathy because it helps decrease the uh, buildup of ammonia in the blood and in the brain. We definitely restrict sodium to 2,000 milligrams. Um, and if edema or ascites is present, then we restrict it even further to 1,000 milligrams per day. So remember, ascites in, is in the abdominal cavity, edema is in the lower extremities, so you'll see swelling by the ankles. If we need to restrict fluids, um, intake and output, so I and O's are really important for patients with cirrhosis. I have seen the restrictions to 15 ml, 1500 mLs per day. I haven't seen the, the severe restriction of 1000 to 1200 mLs per day. Um, we have to supplement with the water soluble vitamins, especially the B vitamins, folate, B12, and thiamine. 
And then the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, we actually um, request from the pharmacy the water soluble form. So that can surpass the liver as well and be metabolized and be ready to be absorbed by the tissues in the cells. Okay, so um, if your patient has to go undergo liver, a liver transplant, there's three phases. Um, we need to know what to do from a nutrition standpoint before the liver transplant, uh, four to eight weeks after, and then long term. Okay, so before the liver transplant, if there's any vitamin, mineral deficiencies, if there's protein malnutrition, protein calorie malnutrition, we have to correct those. So usually we get the lab values for different vitamins and minerals. Um, we usually get total protein, albumin. Um, for liver transplants, they will um, spring for a pre-albumin, like we had mentioned, it's a shorter half-life, so it's more accurate. So after they've had the transplant, four to eight weeks after, we usually have to assess their GI tract. And if their GI tract needs to rest, it's not really functioning after the transplant, then we will provide TPN. Um, or if the gut is functional, then tube feedings. So just from nursing standpoint, you need to make sure that you know that um, we have to provide adequate calories with protein. You can't provide one with the other. These patients after transplants are in hypermetabolic state, so their BMR is very elevated. Um, and one other recommendation is to provide small frequent meals and nutrition supplements in between. So long-term after someone having a transplant, um, because they've been on a high calorie, high protein diet, we definitely want to make sure that there's not excessive weight gain. So they need to like pull back on the protein and the calories and try to increase their amount of activity and lifestyle. Okay, so now let's get into the gallbladder. Uh, make sure you know the different um, medical conditions. So cholelithiasis, cholelelodocolithiasis, and cholecystitis. I, I stumbled on that middle one. Um, so cholelithiasis is when, the first one is when gallbladder, uh, gallstones are present in the gallbladder, okay? The cholelito cholelithiasis, that was better, um, that is when you have, the patient has gallstones that are present in the bile duct of the liver, okay? And then cholecystitis is when the gallstones actually block the cystic duct, okay? It's usually with cholecystitis, um, there's a fever present, so itis, the ending, um, there's some sort of infection, there's some sort of inflammation, okay? You also need to know who is at risk, which patients. Um, usually the elderly patients are at risk for um, gallbladder disease. Um, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, which leads to obesity, um, long-term use of oral contraception or estrogen use, sedentary lifestyle, um, high fat diet, which makes sense because the gallbladder will store the dietary fat. And then women, the multiparity, which means um, women have had one or more children. And so textbook gallbladder disease would be a younger woman who's had one or more children, um, and it typically happens after pregnancy, they go on like a rapid weight loss diet, like a thousand milligrams or less, and they end up in the ER with like cholecystitis. Okay, so 
if you don't know the symptoms of cholelithiasis, um, it's basically mid epigastric pain. So after the patient eats something, so it's like right in the middle, the sternum, and usually when they have a t an attack, the pain radiates to the upper um, right scapula. So it's all right area. So if it, it's like IBS, IBD, that's left lower. Um, so typically the patient will present, there's definitely um, pain and attack. It's usually after eating high fat uh, fried food. Cholecystitis, as the name implies, there's some type of infection, inflammation, so a fever will be present. There'll be pain and tenderness um, by the area of the gallbladder, so the right side um, below the sternum. They usually cannot tolerate dietary fat, so fried foods, high fat foods, like pizza, um, chocolate, french fries, you know, fast food stuff, and they present with nausea, sometimes vomiting. GERD is often um, present, and so clinicians think that, oh, they have GERD, but you have to make sure you understand it's usually the, the right side. Um, so it's in the sternum and then rotating back to the scapula. Um, cholecystitis, we will see jaundice, again, elevation um, in the liver enzymes and steatorrhea, which is fat in the feet. Okay, so pain um, from a diet standpoint to control pain, we recommend a low fat diet. Um, and that is before a cholecystectomy, meaning they had their gallbladder out. If it comes to the fact that they need to have a cholecystectomy and having their gallbladder removed, postoperatively, we'll again start with clear liquids and then progress to a re regular diet. We do recommend that patients follow a low fat diet after a cholecystectomy for at least like three to six months. I mean, some patients tell me that they follow it for the rest of their lives. Um, but the three to six months is important because, okay, so the patient doesn't have a gallbladder now, right? So where are you gonna store the dietary fat? Well, it takes about three months for the liver to transform its cells to be able to store that dietary fat. So um, if they can progress to have um, higher fat foods, then it's based on individual tolerances. Okay, so let's review pancreatitis. So again, um, itis, there's inflammation going on, and typically we'll see um, decreased production of the digestive enzymes and the bicarbonate. Typically, pancreatitis is from alcohol abuse. Um, usually there is like a co-diagnosis if they have gallbladder disease, and sometimes pancreatitis is genetic. So what actually happens is, if you can think about it, the enzymes, um, in the pancreas actually digest the organ and it results in severe pain, um, fever present, and typically we'll see elevated serum enzyme levels. So that's how it's diagnosed. Um, they're not able to absorb fats, dietary fats and protein. So pancreatitis is um, very painful, there's chronic pain, um, and if it's severe enough over time, patients could actually be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So the nutrition therapy, what do we do? Um, 
the first thing is we want to minimize pancreatic secretions because that's what's causing the pain. So we try to initiate enteral tube feedings if the GI tract is able to handle that. And again, that's going to be based on what the dietitian recommends. Um, if the pancreatitis is severe, then we will have to rest the gut and initiate TPN. So again, as I mentioned, they're not able to metabolize fat or protein. Um, okay. And I did mention that um, pancreatitis may lead to type 1 diabetes. Um, I, my daughter ha actually had um, a kid in, his, in her class where he was diagnosed with pancre pancreatitis and then he went to the ER, stayed at the hospital for a while, and then six months later he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So if we're going to feed via tube, we definitely want to recommend an elemental formula, and it has to be low fat. If we can't feed via tube feedings, then you have to think about um, the, the TPN. So the other thing that's important, I want to go back a little bit to the enteral tube feeding. Where are we going to feed if, if the patient is appropriate for enteral tube feedings? So always remember that you have to, I mentioned in lecture, you have to feed below the site of the medical condition or the surgery. So if you think about the pancreas, you cannot feed into the stomach can't feed into the stomach. So you can't do a gastrostomy tube or a G-tube. You have to do below, which is into the small intestine. So we would feed into the jejunum and place a J-tube, a jejunostomy tube, okay? If TPN is warranted, then we would either do the peripheral parenteral nutrition, so that's a line that goes into the hand. So that's more temporary if the patient is MPO for less than 10 days. Um, we could do PPN um, for that amount of days and then switch over to enteral tube feedings after the gut has rested. Or we would need to put in a central line um, either a pick line or a subclavian into the subclavian vein. And those are for more long-term, so patients that are um, gonna be longer on MPO status, um, greater than like a week. Okay, so the recommendations um, for pancreatitis, we definitely have to limit the fat less than 50 grams per day. We incorporate at least 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. Small, frequent meals, we usually recommend six. We have to do enzyme replacement therapy to control the malabsorption. Remember, protein and fat is malabsorbed. Um, staying away from alcohol is probably a given. And then I just want to mention about the MCT oils. So we recommend the medium chain triglycerides. The MCT oils, regular fat, dietary fat, will be absorbed, if you remember from chapter three, into the lymphatic system. Okay, so that's going to go into the pancreas. We want to surpass that. So we will provide for pancreatitis, MCT oil, or medium chain triglycerides that surpasses the lymphatic system 
and goes directly into the portal vein of the liver. So um, we don't have to worry about that pancreatic lipase, which is the enzyme that is secreted by the pancreas. We don't want any stimulation of the pancreas during, um, during this type of inflammation. Okay, well, that's all I have. It's a short chapter. And please reach out and message me if you have any questions. Thanks. Have a great day, guys.